we all know since we are here and especially after the whole day of talking about uh, health and well-being is that uh, our work can unfortunately make us ill or sick and uh, this is because uh, many different reasons such as unreasonable requests uh, for from our managers, difficult and challenging clients, insecurity about our position or uh, our abilities to progress in our careers, get a job or the next job or the next contract, hundreds of email uh, we receive daily and so on and so forth. So all of these factors over longer periods of time uh, can um, lead to feeling stress or anxious about work. And again, over time, this can have negative implications uh, for both physical health and psychological health. Uh, whether it, it is about feeling yeah, unhappy and um, scared and worried and so on, whether it, uh, it is about um, recurring headaches, insomnia, um, occasional or frequent vertigos and uh, so on. So there, there could be different indicators. So basically, uh, when I speak in the, in the context of the current presentation and, and in my research in general, um, I, uh, I will try to make an overview of all these different aspects of health and well-being, including both physical aspects and uh, more psychological aspects, um, those that refer more to feelings of satisfaction and contentment and those that are more about meaning and, and like we heard in the previous presentations about more positive aspects such as flourishing and so on. And also I will try to mention here and there um, both positive aspects, so well-being as it is, and also the lack of those uh, negative aspects such as symptoms and diagnosis. Uh, so all of that is kind of under this umbrella umbrella term. A big umbrella. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, going back to the title of your presentation, uh, is caring about employee health and well-being a perk or necessity and why? Before um, I try to answer to that question, um, I would like to ask, well, all of us uh, and uh, people in the audience to just think for themselves um, about these two questions that you can see in the slide and try to rate uh, from one as being never through three being sometimes to five as always. How often do you feel stressed at your work? And secondly, how often do you feel exhausted uh, by your work? So just um, think for uh, for yourself uh, for for a second or two. Some research shows that uh, these feelings of being stressed about work or being exhausted or even more than that are very frequent. So maybe you already heard some of these statistics uh, during the day. A relatively recent study from Gallup that was done among about 8,000 people in US shows that one out of three employees feel stress at least sometimes during their job and two out of three uh, at least sometimes feel burnout or in our case uh, we mentioned exhaustion as the most frequent aspect of burnout but uh, burnout in itself sometimes can go uh, even worse than that to feeling cynical about the work or detached from one's work or less competent about the work. So basically Although, of course, we could also say that it's quite normal that uh, if we do um, any kind of work, that every now and then we feel stressed, every now and then we feel tired and exhausted, feeling that more than every now and then, so often or always is also quite prevalent. And that's... Uh, um, uh, are sort of attracting attention both of media and the organization and in a way urging us uh, to do something about it. Um, so to go back to your question, I think that, uh, and through the fact that we are all here right today, that um, focusing on uh, health and well-being is, shouldn't be a work, it's more of a necessity. And uh, for a couple of main reasons. First, 
because those employees uh, who experience anxiety, uh, burnout, uh, stress, and so on and so forth, and different um, uh, different also uh, physical symptoms, over time might perform worse in their job. So on average, those employees who experience burnout uh, um, are 13 percent, some studies show, less confident about uh, their ability to perform their work as they think they should be performing. And also half of them have more frequent uh, performance talks or talks about how to meet their targets, how to manage their responsibilities with their managers than those employees who, don't, who do not experience burnout. So there is uh, this belief that happy uh, and healthy worker is good performing worker and in principle, the data uh, from organizational psychology supports that notion. Uh, and secondly, also the um, uh, it's quite expensive for the organizations to finance uh, the healthcare costs of uh, work-related stress, depression, anxiety, burnout, and, and all the others, other um, conditions that might be uh, related to um, yeah, related to work. So again, some statistics shows that those who experience work-related stress are 63 more likely to take uh, a sick uh, day or 23% more likely to have an emergency health-related situation during their workday. So altogether in U.S., uh, this sums up to yeah about hundred billion of dollars per year in healthcare costs, and in the Netherlands where I work, uh, some data for, from Statistics Netherlands shows that this is about three point two billion euros per work. Um, I uh, I've heard I I ran into um, a data that um, yeah General Electric spent more money on um, healthcare costs in the last years than on steel um, that they use uh, for their product. So it's quite expensive. And managing that expenses related to both absences uh, and uh, diminished performance is of course necessary for organizations. But second, I'd like to believe that uh, it's not only about managing the expenses, but also creating um, in a way, a better world or nurturing this shared value that uh, well-being is uh, something that is relevant and that needs to be promoted. And that is also mirrored in uh, increasing attention and awareness um, on, on these issues. Um, and also, so this kind of developed in parallel with the growing awareness and interest in sustainability and especially in sustainability of ecological resources. So it seems that different policymakers and organizational stakeholders became aware that um, minding how organizational practices and activities impact also the, the sustainability of human resources among employees that work for these organizations is something relevant and something that yeah needs to be uh, taken into account. And this is also reflected in uh, these, as you can see in the slides, uh, so two different sustainable development goals posed by um, UN. So yeah, it's a necessity because we want to manage costs, but because also uh, we, we collectively, I guess, uh, are interested in promoting well-being and, and uh, having a workforce that can work sustainably. Yes, so there is time. definitely an evidence and numbers supporting um, uh, that view. Uh, what are the factors at the workplace that stimulate employee well-being and what are those that harm it? Okay, so this is um, a big question. And uh, here I, I will try to make an overview of the different factors that, um, that might take place summed up from different research studies that have been done out there. I assume that today during uh, different talks, you could hear about some specific factors, but also, uh, so in my research, I often do review studies and meta-analysis. So it means that uh, I'm busy with creating summaries of the evidence that we have on a certain topic. Uh, 
So it was uh, close to my <laughs> my style to try to make an overview and summarize some of these factors. Um, in the organizational psychology and organizational behavioral literature, it is, um, of course, there are different ways to talk about the factors that impact employee, employee well-being and different theories and attempts to classify uh, these factors. I would say that the most uh, intuitive and also quite prevalent one is the one that classifies these different factors into job resources and job demands. So job resources is, is think about all the good things that can stimulate employees in meeting their targets, in um, achieving their work goals, but that also stimulate growth, learning, development, um, and satisfaction at the same or overcoming of a certain demands. At the same time, job demands are sort of the other pole um, of the spectrum, and job demands are those factors that represent challenges or disruptions within uh, for employees. They might require sustainable or uh, prolonged effort, uh, prolonged application and use of different skills in order to be overcame. And over time, they can also uh, lead to some physiological and psychological symptoms. So all these uh, all these different uh, resources and demands might operate in different levels, starting from very broadly at the level of broader society, uh, and they're being represented on some economical demands and resources such as you know uh, higher or lower employment rates, higher or lower GDPs in these different context, different political factors and studies looked at the um, autocratic uh, country level leadership um, and different cultural factors because some cultural orientations may also represent a resource in preserving um, health and well-being. Of course, if we focus on the organizational perspective, these factors are more hard to influence and change. So these are maybe some factors that we should acknowledge and take into account, but it's hard for organizations to influence them. At the organizational level, um, there um, there is a model that's called IGLO, and it basically stresses the role of organizational factors, being those factors at more the level of HR policies, such as performance appraisals, the presence of specific policies focused on health and well-being, the different initiatives that stimulate employee motivation, learning, and development. Um, diversity and inclusion policies. So basically the way in which uh, the work is designed, organized and managed that can impact how employees feel working within that companies. At the second level, more direct, if we think about employees are the direct supervisors or the direct managements, uh, managers and uh, different factors at the leader level, so different kinds of leader behaviors also impact how employees feel because they mainly impact uh, the relationship that is developed between uh, employee and, and their leaders. And um, last but not least among these uh, organizational factors are also some team factors such as team climate, teamwork, uh, support that employees get within the teams that can uh, that are more that can uh, in a way represent some protective environment for employees uh, that can help them overcome some dem other demands from the other levels or uh, make the situation even works. And finally, all those things impact the individual, but also not every individual is equal. We heard today about emotional intelligence. Um, studies also show that resilience, optimism, self-confidence, and many other uh, individual factors might play a protective role or make some employees more vulnerable to some uh, demanding and challenging conditions. So there is a lot of factors um, that at the same time might uh, make it a bit complex to comprehend and understand where do we try to influence and intervene. But at the same time, it can mean that organizations have multiple uh, ways and starting points to try to help their employees uh, stay healthy and uh, flourish and be happy at, at their jobs. Great. So at the end, it brings us to a question, how can companies show care 
for employee health and, and um, well-being and what works and what doesn't work. So here we looked uh, at, at an overview uh, of more general group of factors. In, um, in the literature um, and also uh, in some of my own research, uh, some factors are shown to be more uh, influential than the others. And also on some factors we can, as I already said, can influence more uh, than on the others. One of the factors that stands out if you look into this pyramid uh, illustration are re leader related factors. So if we need to pick one, one single factors uh, in this, um, yeah, in this, a bunch of different uh, circumstances that, that that might shape well-being, those would be the direct supervisory leadership related things because the leaders are uh, those who shape the daily work reality of the employees. The leaders are those representatives of the broader organizations with whom they uh, interact more often, those who implement uh, those organizational practices and policies, and also those who contribute a lot to creating of uh, group and team climate and dynamics. So leaders might impact health and well-being both directly uh, through the interaction and relationship with the employees, but also indirectly by shaping all these other factors and um, that that might take place. And well, um, so in the study that we did, that was, as I said, a meta-analysis and a review study where we reviewed uh, yeah, about 241 other studies that people did investigating relationship between different leader behaviors and different indicators of health and well-being among uh, 120,000 employees from 37 different countries. Uh, we showed that indeed uh, constructive leadership, either in form of more transformational behaviors and change-oriented behaviors, such as giving inspiration, providing vision, motivating employees, but also task-oriented behaviors, such as giving concrete instructions, uh, setting clear rules for evaluating performance, uh, relational uh, behaviors, those that are um, yeah, focused on creating supportive uh, and a nice relationship with the employees, and ethics-oriented behaviors that is about following rules and regulations, all contribute to po positive well-being, both in terms of physical and mental health, focused on the job and on life in general, in a more short run and in a longer run. Uh, on the other hand, uh, destructive leader behaviors, either in forms of more passive leadership, so not being present or leading by absence, and active uh, destructive behaviors such as intimidation, life, lack of care, self-centeredness, all uh, over time especially harm uh, employee uh, well-being. And again, this holds uh, for all, uh, all the different aspects of well-being. Now, the, the question that might also help organizations understand uh, how, to, uh, how to influence is also uh, why do these leader behaviors impact employee well-being? And in our different studies, uh, we showed that this is mainly because the leaders are the ones that shape those previously mentioned job resources and job demands. So, for example, this uh, destructive leadership more frequently uh, create the sense of time pressure, overload their employees uh, with different demands, especially cognitive demands re require one person to do a job of a team of five, and that can uh, ha be harmful, obviously. At the same time, those who are more um, constructive through pro providing support and showing care also uh, give employees more autonomy and that helps in feeling confident and feeling in control uh, at work. So um, yeah, this is this is basically uh, how and why leaders impact uh, different aspects of employee well-being. Um, yeah, feel free, of course, to interrupt me. Uh, but um, yes, so there are different ways, of course, how organizations 
approach showing care and uh, trying to influence employee well-being. So uh, promoting employee well-being and protecting employees from the stressful aspects of their job, sometimes those are the, the aspects that are inherent of the job that employees are doing, uh, should be in a way the results of a systematic effort. And of course, uh, now when I listed all these ways in, in which leaders can harm or protect employees, this also means that this is quite a demanding role to take so that for leaders themselves and their own well-being, uh, this kind of sets a requirement to be a superhuman and to be able to manage all of this, to provide support, to give vision, to give clear tasks, but also to manage all the other responsibilities and obligations. So when we speak about employee well-being, we also shouldn't forget the leaders themselves and their own well-being and how they can be supported to preserve themselves and then the employees that they work with. In addition uh, to these leadership-related factors, the second uh, aspect that I would like to mention are different health promotion practices in organizations. So because impacting or um, employee health and well-being is uh, important and can save money and uh, contribute to performance, companies implement different ways, start strategies, different policies, different short or long interventions to stimulate well-being. What is important to stress, at least from the research perspective, that these kind of initiatives um, and interventions are not a substitute for a proper work organization, for a proper leadership, for the organization of work that doesn't create excessive prolonged time pressure and excessive uh, demands. Of course, we all have short deadlines sometimes, but we are here speaking more about the the whole culture that is built around um, excessive uh, demands or some other harmful circumstances. Um, these uh, work health promotion practices and initiative can more serve as uh, an add-on uh, and um, as a as a way as well to temporarily more in the short run uh, help and uh, boost uh, health and well-being. And here um, are the results of a different uh, meta-analytic study that was performed uh, among uh, 100,000 employees from uh, 46 studies and across uh, different countries. Of course, so the research just, on the role... Yes. Can I just stop you here for a second? Um, since we have a questions uh, regarding leaders and their uh, okay okay sure health uh, in employee health and well-being so um what specific leader behaviors are most important for employee well-being such as uh, feedback communication leadership style and the second question is uh, a bit tricky so how do we care about leaders well-being uh, yes. Um, so what specific leader behaviors are most important? Um, again, research shows, research studied some behaviors more than the others. So we have more evidence that doesn't always mean that these are more important, but we are more confident that they are important. And a lot of research was done on transformational leader behaviors. Those are behaviors that uh, in which leaders are focused on change and transformation. They uh, try to motivate uh, their employees to inspire, to set an example, to be the role with whom uh, employees can identify uh, and to, in a way, uh, lead towards the, the shared vision. Uh, and these behaviors uh, have a uh, yeah, quite stable relationship with employee well-being. In addition to those uh, behaviors that are focused on creating a relationship, good relationship um, are also uh, prominent, especially when it comes to uh, psychological well-being. So showing care, showing support, asking employees how they are, um, uh, showing within the team that it's important to have transparent communication that is that is also um, 
yeah, that is also important. And these behaviors are shown to be more important than giving clear tasks or having uh, appraisal systems or and so on, other things that are focused more on how the job is done. Uh, but of course, this can vary uh, across different contexts. And uh, yeah, so, so to the best of my knowledge, these are uh, the, the behaviors for which we have the most evidence on. How do we care about leaders' well-being? So this is a very interesting question. And now I'm realizing that we dedicate less time or no time uh, to this aspect uh, by um, training leaders, uh, developing leaders, giving, uh, again, clear um, responsibilities and job descriptions to leaders when they find themselves in that role, not expecting that the leaders are born to be leaders and they are going to bring it and manage it. And also, uh, um, in a way, as leaders uh, take try or should try to take care of their employees, the organizations should show different ways to care about the leaders. And then also sensitizing leaders to be mindful about how they are doing and when they need to take care of themselves and when they can show up for their employees. That's also important um, to keep in mind. Thank you very much. Um, no other questions, right? Uh, no. For now. Okay. Uh, so, um, yes, when it comes to those health promotion practices, as I said, the evidence is less strong than for the leadership. Of course, it does seem that these practices can help, uh, but yeah, the evidence is not so convincing uh, across different studies. And here in the slide, you can see uh, what are the different uh, practices that are implemented across organizations and that are evaluated. Uh, one thing uh, in these last minutes that I would like to stress is the role of availability and opportunity to do physical exercise, because that uh, practice has been showed, shown as um, consistently related to lower absenteeism and to better feeling of psychological well-being. And apart from the work context, there is a lot of research done, like thousands of controlled trials that show that physical activity, regardless of its um, intensity, boosts uh, emotional well-being and a recovery for work among healthy individuals and those who are already experiencing some challenges. Uh, when it comes to work recovery, actually some studies show that strenuous physical exercise such as running or um, yeah, gym training or I don't know, uh, have stronger impact than those more mild forms of exercises, but that's, that can also be questioned. So any physical exercise, as long as it's regular, helps uh, within uh, work domain as well. And organizations should find a way to integrate this in a way that is not additional burden for employees, but it is also not creating additional stress and competition on um, uh, yeah, who is going to exercise more or make, I don't know, more steps and so on. So in a way that is uh, serving the purpose and not uh, bringing more demands and challenges. Um, so back many other smaller interventions, including short-term online interventions and ergonomic interventions can also uh, help. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically all ways in which organizations try to promote health and well-being are um, appreciated. Um, and yes, basically this is what I uh, plan to share with you uh, for today. One last remark is to keep in mind that not in all organizational contexts, yeah, you probably know uh, that better than me because I assume most of you are practitioners, but not everything works everywhere. And our research at least shows that the more vulnerable employees are, so the more uh, stressful the work conditions are where they work, the, the more uh, demanding, economical conditions that they're facing are, the more lower they are in the socioeconomic ladders, these uh, initiatives that come from the side of organizations and the direct managers are especially protective and useful for preserving health 
And uh, yes, uh, here you can find some of my uh, contact details and uh, the link to the website where you can read more about our studies.